welcome back. Um, artist estates, who cares? We are in the midst of Berlin Art Week. We are surrounded by hundreds of galleries, thousands of works of art, and innumerable artists. Quite understandably, um, these artists spend more time making works of art than um, thinking about what will happen to them. But in this session, we're discussing why it's important for artists to address legacy issues in their lifetime um, and work out precisely what they require of their estates um, and to whom they can turn to for help. Um, our speakers are the art historian and academic Frederica Haufer, who lectures on, among other things, estate management and is a member of the executive board of the Federal Association of Artists Estates. Um, uh, Loretta Wurtenberger is a lawyer and founder of the Institute for Artist Estates, who's been working um, with these estates and with artist endowed foundations and advises on legacy planning and has written a very useful book on the subject. Um, and we also have an artist, which is rather crucial here, um, the uh, painter and sculptor Laiku Ikimura, who lives in Cologne and Berlin. And um, I thought we'd start by um, contemplating the abyss. You know, what happens when an artist makes no provision for their estate? I mean, what's the worst scenario? Um, we want a real horror story of why it's a good idea to do this now. Um, would anybody like to contribute? Well, or why don't you... I think it's also a decision. So, sunset, container. Okay. Mm -hmm. But would, would you like to start already? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, no, I mean... I, I thought you were introducing also her? No? But yes, I have. Oh, you have? Yeah. Oh, sorry, oh, I, sp oh, sorry. I, I speak... So um, very fluent. <laughs> very fast. Okay, yeah. Very <laughs> okay. yes. Uh, but as an artist, I mean, you must have seen various friends who have left disastrous um, estates in with family members who don't have a clue and yes. presumably the works have just got dispersed or damaged or yeah. I mean wh what is I mean does this happen often is what sort of disasters are we looking at well um, yeah we are living uh, very fortunately uh, much longer and so the um, friend and um, acquaintance and um, many um, artists as my who I know sometimes just suddenly pass away and then I could see that uh, disaster that happens because the family, for example, were not prepared and the artist didn't leave any message and uh, he didn't organize because he thinks he is eternal, you know. Everybody wants to think like that. And also I myself, when you asked me, uh, why me? You know, I'm still very active and alive, and so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's Living kind of, a, yes. yeah, it's kind of a, a contradiction. On the other way, I started to think about after the big exhibitions, the large exhibitions that I have done, uh, especially this year um, at uh, Tokyo National Museum. Um, that this was a very really large uh, exhibition, kind of retrospective, and I followed uh, the show uh, at uh, Kunstmuseum Basel. The two important institutions, they um, exhibitions were for me also important for my, well, coming further, going further as an artist. Uh, with uh, not using the word career, which I don't like. Anyway, and then for the preparation, it was so um, important and required uh, um, many data, many um, what I have done before. And so since uh, the preparation um, was started, um, I had to think about what I have done during my last 40 years which is really much longer than, for example, Make or, you know, many other great artists. So we are living much longer. So suddenly I have noticed, I have done in the 80s many works, and I thought they were kind of Jugendsünde. I don't know the word in English. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, and then usually I show after 
1990. But this time, because the Kunstmuseum Basel has kept many works of mine, I did not know. So there was more than 100 pieces at the museum and um, sleeping. So I could see, I had to see the works that I have done. So it was kind of like uh, confronting with your past. And uh, this uh, was a consciousness then to think about the future. Mm -hmm. Because the future is what we are doing, what we are living. So if it's like that, why not to create, shape the form that I would like to leave my work one day, you know, much later, of course. Uh, of course. And, uh, <laughs> and also interesting because it involves the people, because I have no family in that sense, uh, like children also. I have my uh, beloved partner and uh, we are very good uh, in the relationship. But um, if we don't have any, um, even not a cat and not a dog, so what, I, what will, do, will you do with all my works? And then suddenly I felt like, well, my works are not product. My works are more like uh, beings, creatures. They, um, they need a protection, yes. Mm -hmm. And they need also being in kind of a, being a developing. It's not only that um, it's a, yeah, very easy to uh, compare with the children, but I think it's a, it's, they have their own power, they have their own will to survive. We have to respect, but it's good to have the guidance. And this guidance, I can start to create, to communicate like today. I'm, I came here because I wanted to learn. And this is uh, my starting point. And I've started to think about the foundation, yes. But we can talk about that later. All right, well, that's... Um, um, and um, when do you think... I mean, when do you think artists should start thinking about their legacies? I mean, should, in fact, it not even begin as a legacy question, but just begin in a way of, of documenting your own mm -hmm. output very well so that you have your own archive before you think about um, passing it on. Because as we know, not all artists are organized in this way and mm -hmm. don't wish to be. And it's, um, uh, what, what would you recommend if there is a... I think it's a pleasure that the audience is so young. <laughs> <laughs> And it's astonishing, but I also uh, gave a lecture at the um, art university uh, and uh, a lot of young students um, uh, are interested in, in that question so that uh, they begin to document the, um, uh, their work in a good way and also collect uh, documents. The paper is also very, uh, the, the documents of life and so on, it's also very important. And uh, so you have to collect and you have to throw away <laughs> <laughs> very early. So it's yeah. not, then it's not a disaster when you are getting older. So you edit as you go along is what you're saying, really. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, when um, Loretta, what should one what should an artist do for to find guidance i mean where is the best place to begin how is the best place to be um i just f first wanted to comment on what Lyko said because i think it's extremely brave to face the question of your own legacy and um, i mean we all don't like to think about our death our mortality and i think artists especially often don't like it because they have a idea of immortality because they leave an oeuvre to the world which lives beyond them. And so I think it's often for artists double difficult to think about these aspects. And on the other hand, because the art world is professionalizing, has professionalized, because we have new archiving tools through the, um, through the computer, etc., we have more and more also us clients and peop, um, artists we work with who start facing these questions much, much earlier. Mm -hmm. um, we just did a big project with an artist who was in his mid-40s, actually, who turned to us and asked, um, how can I organize my studio archive mm -hmm. in such a way that it's later a good basis for a catalogue raisonné and later a good basis for museum shows? And exactly what you say, 
looking at the past and while going on editing to be able to serve later the academic world by giving access to your files, mm -hmm. to serve the museum world by keeping back good works and being able to service shows later on in a certain stage of the career and also to later deal with the art market because I think that's very important that these three pillars, the art market, the museum world and the academic world, are the three pillars which each of these you must play to have a successful work um, for, an, for an artist's legacy or an artist's foundation. And you were asking to, to whom um, people traditionally turn to or where they can turn to. I mean, traditionally, it, they often turn to lawyers um, because it's very fast the question, should I do a foundation? The foundation is the um, most common known um, vehicle for these things. If you think about the Judd Foundation, especially in America, the big foundation, the Wall Foundation, the, um, the Kooning Foundation, but there are much more other legal forms. And for me, the legal form is always the end product of a process which starts much earlier and where people ask themselves, what is the goal I want to create? Do I want to sustain a family with my legacy? Do I want to um, sustain my own oeuvre? Or do I maybe want to give for another good cause? Like, for example, Mapplethorpe gave for the AIDS um, research a, a lot of his work to be sold to then sustain AIDS research. So those are strategic questions you have to answer first, and then at the end you come to the lawyer mm -hmm. and and decide with him what is the right legal form. And this 360 degree approach, that's an approach we at the Institute for Artists' Trade try to work on with our clients to really understand what is their wish, mm -hmm. what is the need, and what is also the emotional basis of all that. Um, what are the emotional relationships to the galleries? What are the emotional relationships to other, st I call them stakeholders, family members, husbands, wives, other people interested in the oeuvre, and how can you create a legacy vehicle which brings all these different aspects together, is financially sustainable, because there's often no public um, support for artist estates, but artist estates normally have to finance themselves mostly through selling work. Mm -hmm. So you really have to create a business plan, you have to create a substantial a vehicle, otherwise it's a great idea, but you can't finance it. Mm -hmm. And then you have to find at the end the legal form. It's an incredibly complicated process. It, it is, seems. but it's a wonderful process. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. and, and presumably a, a foundation um, is, I, I mean, with all of this, there's not a one size fits all, that it, it's very different for an artist like Donald Judd to somebody who hasn't been so successful, who doesn't have the money. Um, I mean, can you, can you help people at all different levels, people who, um, 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 lawyers are a very expensive option, and, um, or, or uh, and certainly founding a, uh, an institution like a, a, a foundation, sorry to repeat that, but um, it is going to be a costly process, which not all artists or estates can afford. I mean, you're asking about financial resources, money in this field, because, yeah. um, the, we all know the stories of the um, artist who was discovered after his death and suddenly raises to world fame. But especially in the art world of today, where everything is looked at and searched for the new big thing, I think this will happen less and less because the whole market has become more transparent. And so I th it is a fundamental question for artists during the lifetime to also think how can they create financial resources if they want to create an artist um, legacy vehicle. And um, it's not always about only keeping good works back. So the estate has works they can later work with and sell. It's also, for example, I just, there's a very interesting foundation here in Berlin. It's called the Erhard Foundation. It was a quite unknown, but very good photographer. And he had um, his, he had a studio. And the son sold the studio and bought from this money a house here in Mitte in the mid-90s, and he rented out three stories of that house to finance the fourth story in which the estate is. So it's really interesting. It, I mean, that's real estate business on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's today the financial basis of that exactly. foundation. And I know a lot of other artist estates who have used, or artist estates foundations, who have used the real estate they inherited to finance 
the estate work later. So those can be models. Models can be like um, Paul Klee, for example, he um, was very aware of the foundation later to be established in his name. And he put on the back of his canvases always SKL, Sonderklasse, was the abbreviation for Sonderklasse. And um, he put it on all those works, which on the one hand side he found for himself in his career, not from the market perspective, but for him, his own, own artistic development important. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, when he had the feeling it was an extremely good work, which would be sold later well, he put also SKL on that. And okay. that was so wise because he did a double path. On the one hand, he later um, an enabled the estate to provide Exhibi museums, exhibitions with the whole story of his artistic career because they had all these important works. And on the other hand, they could sell later for very good prices, works and buy that, finance it. Well, presumably not every artist has the luxury of being able to hold back um, work that they but consider But it's fundamental. Important. It's fundamental really? to hold back. Okay. It is fundamental to hold back, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> good. Very good. <laughs> but, but the galleries, they don't <laughs> like it. No. 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 Well, that's <laughs> the, the essential tension with the, one of the three pillars of, of, of this. And um, Frederica, perhaps you could tell us about um, um, what you do in terms of, of your non-profits and... Um, Okay, maybe I introduce uh, the Bundesverband yes, Künstlernachlass yeah. a little bit because we just uh, we just founded it in 2017, mm -hmm. so it's rather uh, new. Um, the Bundesverband is an independent umbrella organization and uh, a non-profit organization. Um, it's uh, well, the Bundesverband. In English, it's a federal association of artists' estates. It represents cultural policy concerns of the regional-based institutions, non-profit organizations and foundations, which are dedicated to the preservation, comprehension, and research and mediation of estates of artists. Um, 20 years ago, I come to the members, the 20 years ago, more and more initiatives based on civic engagement were founded. Um, these are new types of institutions um, next to the museums or artist foundations. Um, they mostly take care of artist estates in their own region. These states so, uh, work in documents, uh, are inventored, archived, exhibited and published. Their databases are networked with national and European databases, so um, it's uh, it's a non uh, all are non-profit organisations, and uh, um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, persons care of it, but it's private engagement, it's private money, and it's private time. But uh, in all initiatives are uh, art historians who um, care for. Um, the doc for a right documentation, and uh, so we um, vernetzen, via, uh, we, we, link, uh, we link them, so uh, we have a, um, we want uh, in, in every region a uh, core um, depot for, um, also we, we name it Kernbestand, Depot, so it's an uh, what you talked about. Um, it's an extract, uh, maybe 50 or 60 works um, of an oeuvre. So um, you can um, afford that, and so that uh, every region can decide uh, which estate uh, will go there. <coughs> but of course, it uh, we need money for that for this uh, infrastructure. It's uh, not much because uh, we are, the initiatives are working for such a long time, and, uh, but we, have all, we only have project um, monies. So uh, we have to, for an infra infrastructure, um, for, for example, for competence centers uh, in the regions, uh, we need money and support um, of the uh, public support, uh, but I think it's uh, very effective because um, 
most of the art artists, uh, if you if you uh, um, if you look at the statistics, uh, ninety five percent of the artists cannot live from their work, and also uh, the question is the women. Uh, I read in the uh, in the art market report. Um, the actual ma art market report that 20% women are represented at fairs. So we have, uh, it's not, uh, um, a lot of people say if, that uh, if, a gallery, if an artist is not in a gallery or in a museum or in many museums, uh, it's not worth uh, to, uh, to collect. But I think there is a, there, there are a lot of uh, artist estates, not everyone, um, but we have to uh, talk about who is um, who is worth to um, to be collected because it 's another question if you are important for a region or if you are important in an international discourse I, I think we have um, 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 to talk about that also. And decide who decides, after all, whether it's going to be mm -hmm. uh, art historians or it's going to be um, dealers mm -hmm. and the, best the is, artists, yeah, you know, whatever. The best is that the artist decides. Yeah. But uh, what I said no, uh, no, in sorry, my uh, first... Uh, of which what? artists are selected for, um, um, for representation in, in, in these? Well, um, which uh, the, the, the artists who um, exhibited in, an, in national or international um, museums and uh, who are published in uh, special magazines and so on. So you have um, the question of the... I, I, I don't like the word, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different level. But um, it's, uh, you, have an, you have another relevance in the region than in, uh, in Europe or s something like that. I'm also an historian, and uh, we, um, um, you have, uh, in, in history, you have uh, regional history <coughs> in, the, in European comparison. So this is also um, what you can... Um, afford for, um, for the history. Well, I think what's rather interesting is that we tend to think of as an artist estate as a physical mm -hmm. repository, mm -hmm. um, but of course it's, it can be much more of that. I mean, it, and, and this is presumably, as you say, in this digital age, that it is a sort of, um, if everything is committed to digitally to an archive and it is made accessible, it has an afterlife in a way that the actual pieces themselves um, don't necessarily if they're in storage. And, and the idea of this as being a, a living and evolving archive is presumably very encouraging for, for um, 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 artists like Leiko. I mean, presumably you'll be very happy. You, what, you, you, what you're interested in um, is for museums to continue to show your work, for your work <coughs> still to be um, yeah, very important, uh, visible, yes. but also accessible even in a yeah. in a digital way is better than yeah. Than, this is maybe new new access, new uh, possibility, and uh, I'm now talking about this also with a specialist, and she made a <coughs> very big um, uh, resume of uh, the works of uh, Luke, Luke Tremon, and I started to talk with her also. But um, as you said, well, artists should decide when, um, if the works uh, belong to the museum or for theirs. But it's sometimes not so easy because, uh, of course, every artist who wish to have their works at their institutions, and it's also important not only the artist will that to do his own or her own uh, estate or um, a foundation, but it's so necessary to have um, existing institutions, they own your work. But there is a still the problem. I do not want always saying about this uh, position of female artist, but, um, and the situation has now much 
it's it's really much better. But I have to tell you the uh, situation. It's not always um, naturally developed that uh, female artists, um, their work are belonging to the um, one art fair. It's maybe one situation, but uh, the collection of the museum. And this, we have to struggle still now, because I cannot um, decide be myself. Well, I want to have my work in at the MoMA or, <laughs> or Pompidou. Well, they, they did it at the, um, the last time, not MoMA, but uh, Pompidou. But it's a long, long time, you know, until they acquired one sculpture of mine. And, um, you know, there are many other museums. But uh, I cannot decide. I would like them to do that. But, um, you know, it's also as a situation. I would like to add something to that because I think mm -hmm. for me the um, aim of estate work is always to keep the legacy alive. And what does that mean? It means for me that every new generation of museum people, collectors, art historians find their own new approach to the oeuvre. Because even if you look at the legacies of quite well-known artists, we, d we started working with the estate of Hans Arp like 10, 12 years ago. Um, besides that they had mismanaged the estate for a long time, it was also another problem that the same 20 blockbuster works were asked for loan again and again and again. And so one of the first things we try to do is open up the estate's collection and try to encourage museum people to see more than the 20 blockbuster works. Because an even if very well-known oeuvre can kind of die a second death because it's not kept alive and people don't work with it in an active way. And it can kind of, um, kind of become suffering of its own success. Same actually the problem of the Judd estate it had like 10, 20 years ago. The same five boxes were asked for loan again and again. And so what we did, for example, at the um, Art Foundation is, um, because we give loans all the time to museums worldwide, but we said, if you want to have a loan, we don't ask for a loan, um, for, for, a, um, for money for the loan, nothing, but we have one precondition. We want you to come to the estates collection here in Berlin, and because we, uh, we got all the works out of the boxes and we created a Schaulager, through which the art historians can walk and see the works and that they're not all in containers. And that is always visible. And so we said the precondition is before we give you a loan, you come and see once what else there is. And that was really an important step because through that suddenly the museum curators said, I didn't know that art did something like that. Oh my God, the late work, that's so interesting. Could we maybe have one of those instead? Or we started conversations out of which like five, six, seven years later suddenly museum exhibitions came out of because we had shown them the Schaulager six years earlier. So I think that's very important to, to invite each new generation to find their own approach. And the same with academics. Again, the op example, it was that the whole academic world, all the Doktorarbeit, the Doktor thesis, Nobody wrote a doctor thesis about ARP 15 years ago anymore. They, they, he, everybody thought everything has been written about surrealism, data time, etc. But what about ARP's relationship to uh, the American art market in the 50s and 60s? Nobody had written about that. What about the relationship of ARP to the development of art like Warhol in the early 60s? Nobody had thought about that. So what we did is, with not much money, not much budget, we're talking about five to 10,000 euros a year here, we gave out scholarships to young doctorates if they would write a doctorate about ARP, and we said we'll open up the archive 100%. And um, suddenly we have young artist and art historians again interested, and we provide a publication platform, and they can publish it and talk to others about it. And I think that's, that's what successful legacy work is about, to, to inviting oh. each generation to have a new, fresh view on the oeuvre. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I personally also, I tried that uh, with uh, Nolde, mm -hmm. and I went to the Nolde Stiftung. It was uh, before this uh, controversial uh, exhibition at uh, Hamburger Bahnhof, and it was, well, we know um, very well about his uh, political attitude. But it's, uh, I always thought he's uh, more, uh, you know, kind of n n naive. 
so that uh, he has at that time this position. But I could see his uh, value of his work and his contemporariness. And also maybe this uh, political, um, yeah, um, controversial positions that we can talk about. But anyway, I invited him to my museum exhibition at uh, uh, Arnsop. It's a, there's a beautiful exhibition, a space, a museum, small but beautifully uh, done architecturally. And so I was invited to make a solo show. And I said, instead, I do, uh, do collaborate with, uh, with uh, Nolde because uh, um, you know, it's completely different uh, temper temperament and, to and also character. But I thought it's another generation. I would like to contextualize my work in a different way, different generation. So I, you know, we contemporaries are more just focused on it to be part of the market system in America. Hey, this, I say, not only shit, but I. Sometimes this makes me angry. And I wanted to do in a different direction also. Hey, open your eyes. It's so many interesting artists also in Germany or the border of Germany. I'm living here. Why am I part of this culture? I would like to contextualize my work also. Maybe it's a challenge. I, I, nobody says then afterwards this is the answer, but I think it was a very important challenge. Then I had to go to the Sibyl and see his uh, estate, which was great. And you see a lot of uh, also letters and his writings. You see that it's, he, he's a big humanist as well. I do not want just protect or uh, criticize his uh, letters, but um, um, this was for me very important um, well, experience. I also did with uh, East Asian art. so. My interest is uh, also inviting and also asking other generations, other countries, other culture, um, because it's, uh, we forgot the universality of the art. We, or we are all specialized only, oh, this is a artist, a German artist, a painter of uh, after, Krieg, after war time. Or, you know, this categorization is sometimes uh, limiting our perception. And so um, during I live, I really like to do, I have uh, so many ideas, you know. And uh, also I did a show at uh, Roland Eck, and then I discovered the app, and especially his wife. This is also important, not only you're working on the, uh, discovering his or, you know, area work, but you are discovering his wife's I know, many interesting wives, artists. <laughs> Think about that. It's uh, very important. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, true. And uh, do you find, Loretta, that there are many foundations that are, are being incredibly proactive and imaginative about this? Because Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, I think we have, we have kind of the American foundations, which are simply, I would say, maybe 10, 15 years ahead of European foundations. And there's a, there's a clear reason for that. It was um, that the art market was so strong in the 40s, 50s, 60s in America, that generation died in the late 80s, early 90s. And there, the first big superpower foundations, as I call them, were founded. You had people like Warhol, died, Warhol was actually the first one then de Kooning, Liechtenstein, uh, Rauschenberg, etc., etc., And you had estates which suddenly had hundreds of millions worth of art. So they were financially really a, a powerful force. And around that, a professionalization of that foundation sector in America took place in the late 90s, early, 90s, early 2000s. And at the same time, the American tax system benefited that because they were kind of forced to create non-profit foundations, which led to the professionalization of that field there. And here in Europe, the first very big and very successful professionally led foundation was the Moore Foundation. Mm -hmm. Actually also driven by tax issues, um, Henry Moore in the mid-70s had tax issues. He found the foundation 
during his lifetime, not so much because he totally understood that he has to take care of it, but because he had tax issues. <laughs> so he had to, um, f and, and he was employed by his own foundation. He hated it mm -hmm. because he had the feeling he's an employee of somebody. That's not the way he used to, was used to live. And then he passed away in the early 80s, and his foundation at the peak had about 100 million um, pounds of endowment. Mm -hmm. Um, after the financial crisis, it went down to 80, 70 million, but still you had a strong amount through which you could do very, very professional work. Mm -hmm. And they have done amazing work because they not only took very good play, um, care of his place in Perry Green, which has become the most beautiful exhibition area, but they also supported sculpture and um, artists working in sculpture in the UK for the last, I think, almost 30 years yeah. in the most amazing way. And if you now look at the generation of artists which are today very successful in the art market, you have a lot of Germans. Um, Gerd Richter, Polke passed away three years ago, um, Baselitz, etc. And it's simply a question of time until we also here in Germany will have the need of much more professionalization because it comes from a financial drive. You will have huge estates, yeah. very valuable estates, mm -hmm. and you can't just handle them the way you handled estates 30 years ago. So that really has changed or oh, is yes. changing. Yes. Well, I was interesting about, interested about you talking about the three pillars and yeah. the art market being one of them. And of course, it's a question, all of these things is, um, are balancing acts because think about um, uh, um, the estate of, of Clifford Still, for example, who I think is an artist who is hugely under, underrated. And the, I suspect that one of the reasons he's hugely underrated is that he withdrew from the market. He kept virtually everything. And so whereas his peers were continually being... Um, uh, their prices were rising, they were in the public domain much more, they were having more exhibitions. He his reputation in a way suffered, I think, as a result of that, although it, it shouldn't have done. So, I mean, I think all, um, presumably, it is a question of balance. You're totally right, and if one likes it or not, today, the art market is such a fundamental force driving careers and also those of artists' estates. And what is bought is shown in the museums and what is shown in the museums is bought. And it's, it's a balance. I mean, Clifford Still, I think it was him who also, when he passed away in his, um, in his testament, what's the English word for testament? Will. Um, will, in his last will, um, wrote that he would give it to any museum who would be willing to create a room for his work and show it constantly and he gave his estate more or less away to a museum. And that leads to a totally different discussion. Are museum good places for estates to be? And to my view, not in the sense it has been traditionally done, because uh, it, like some years ago, it was the most desirable thing for many artists to give their estate to a museum. But it led, especially in the world of today, where the museums are full until the roof, sure. to the fact they get one show, just after the donation is done and after that it all goes into the cellar. Sure. And many museums even are not legally entitled to engage with the art market. Mm -hmm. And to keep a legacy alive, you need the art market. Yeah. And so if you bury yourself into the um, cellar of a museum, forget it, it's over, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's done. And the art market, as I said, if you like it or not, is such a driving force. And if you don't integrate the art market into your estate work, you lose a lot of resources. Hmm. Especially the art market and uh, also the working with the gallerist, they have visions and also uh, following what you have done and the belief, believe that you, your work will have value. And this is so important, then you find this person and a relationship with the gallerist, the next and the next generation. Because I'm also confronted with this the change of the generations. There were many important uh, dealers, gallerists, and they got old and even passed away. Mm -hmm. So uh, what to do? Then suddenly many artists have forgotten because nobody mm -hmm. cares. Um, so uh, it's important in a lifetime to think about that too. So which galleries, uh, they understand your work, they sell your work well, they locate, you know, uh, some positions, your work in the different places. Not only museum, we, uh, we didn't talk about the collectors. I think it's also another 
private situation, which is very important because many collectors are more initiative um, rather than and faster and more responsible. Not all, because many are also thinking only on money. But uh, I know a couple of um, private collectors without their help and their support and their belief. I'm not here where I'm now, and I want to go further. So we have to think about that also private collectors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also this generation, that their sons, usually the problem is the great collectors and the kids, they're not interested in, in the art of the earth, not all. This is sometimes very um, pity. But then you have to think about the following, following generation. They start again to interest. So, you know, there are different movement. Well, I think that generational mm. difference is, is huge. I mean, because um, most artists work with a, a, a dealer who may be their age and they grow up together mm -hmm. and then suddenly they both get to this yeah. point and it's, it's sometimes if they have become a superstar, that's mm -hmm. fine. And somebody like Anthony Doffe, when he decided to retire, he said, you know, it's a kid's game now. You've got to be in the same generation mm -hmm. of the of the upcoming artists. Yeah. But he very carefully positioned all of his yeah. stable of artists with what he thought were the mm -hmm. right dealers. Um, but of course, that's actually not that. That's easy if if you are a profitable artist, and it's not so easy if you are a, somebody who is still making their way. Fred, well, we, uh, in our initiatives, when we have declared uh, the canvas stand, then uh, the other works are sold. So visibility, oh, okay. yes, yeah. the visibility is so important, and I would agree. The art market and exhibitions and publications are. Everything is important to uh, to uh, hold the work alive, and uh, also to the foundations or other independent uh, organizations are important to um, divide the work from the family. I think you have this. Uh, you have seen it at the Schlemmer estate, for example. If you have this, um, a lot of people. Um, who deal with it and uh, also the emotional uh, part. Um, it's much better for an estate to be independent from the family. Also, if you, so yeah, I think no. you, also if you, if you look in in history, for example, um, if you see the Georg Kolbe uh, estate, for example, he um, at lifetime he. Um, he wrote in his last uh, will that he wanted to uh, f that uh, he wanted a foundation, um, and he document he had uh, also uh, declared a canvas stand, uh, and he had uh, document also co collected the documents and had a good documentation, and um, now um, the the estate is. Uh, uh, newly seen, I think it's a um, new con contextualization, contextualization. Um, and uh, you see it, for example, if you um, uh, compare it with uh, Scheibe, for example, who has uh, is the nearly the same generation. He's not so. Um, nobody knows him yet, but uh, Georg Kolbe is. Uh, now alive, uh, not in the 30, last 30 years so much, but uh, um, through new context of art market and so, which uh, was exhibited in the museum. Now um, people look at him again. I, uh, I don't agree uh, I think um, this on is the mm -hmm. family side at yeah. all because, yes, you're totally right, there are many, many stories of horrible mm -hmm. widows and, mm -hmm. and inco incompetent children. But on the other hand, there are so many wonderful stories about children, often daughters, mm -hmm. who have um, worked all their lives for, for an estate and without them, many estates, especially estates of not so well-known artists, wouldn't be around anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think family is a fantastic resource for an estate. Um, th and it's about, yes, it's about balancing professionalism and emotions, and it's about educating the mm -hmm. children generation. And that's what we do with our seminars at the Institute for Artists Estates. The next one will be taking place in 10 days in Los Angeles, where we bring together 30 
estate families, children, living artists, um, wives and husbands, to educate them. We have four days, eight hours per day, just a real download on all estate-related matters. And if children are willing or spouses are willing to really learn the estate business, their emotional attachment to the work is such a great resource because they know the work intimately um, and th they know the work very close. They have stories to tell. They know the archives. And also they stand for the artist in a certain way. Just think about Sandy Rower, for example, who is the um, far grandson of um, Calder. Mm -hmm. And he is just managing the estate of Calder in such a professional way. Um, I'm thinking of Christopher Rauschenberg, who has been put on the board of the Rauschenberg Foundation. Rauschenberg was quite clever, actually. He put the foundation in place during his lifetime and puts friends on the board to watch them, how they behave, <laughs> if they do it well. Yeah. And the, he replaced some also. And the foundation is a professionally led foundation, which is not on the t under the total influence on the family, but they have Christopher Rauschenberg on the board, who is the voice of the family. Mm -hmm. and who incorporates also the artist into the next generation. Yeah. Um, or Reina Judd and Flavin Judd, they, they are the strong persons, people in the Judd Foundation. They are the board's president since they were 22 and 23 years old. And they have such a force, mm -hmm. I think. So I, I don't agree that. And, and I, had, I had one last story on that. Uh, when I wrote the book, I, had, I did about 60 interviews with um, estates and estate families and um, foundations. It was very funny because I had on one morning two interviews and the one was first with the lawyer who is heading the um, uh, Mapplethorpe Foundation since 20 years and I asked him uh, at, each, at the end of each interview, I asked him for a piece of advice and he said, never put a family member on the board. <laughs> that afternoon I was with Raina Judd together, I asked her the same question and he said, never put a lawyer on the board. <laughs> 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 so that yeah. answers that. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, presumably there's no one who's going to be a better keeper of the flame. They are passionate to keep. I love that word, keep up the flame. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've just yeah. been writing recently about yeah. Dina Verne and, and Mayol. I mean, yeah. she fought, not only did she create the museum, but she fought for his sculpture to be in the Tuileries. I mean, yeah. what a tremendous legacy. I mean, that's more important than anything else. Yeah. This is part of Parisian life. I think mm. maybe you misunderstood not on family me because okay. uh, I, mean, I, mean, I meant the, um, the legal. You, you also, the foundation is uh, independent. Mm -hmm. You have mem members on the board from the family, maybe, but it's independent. So yeah, but even Sorry, the, the knowledge, sorry, yeah. of course. Yeah, but even there, I don't totally agree because for many mm -hmm. foundation, for, for many estates, a foundation mm -hmm. is a too big vehicle. A foundation mm -hmm. costs a lot of money. You have you a lot of administrative issues, yeah. and there are many foundations or estates, also where the estate material is the main inheritance for the children, mm -hmm. also financially, and they want to. May they mm -hmm. want to get money out of it. And I think mm -hmm. that's also sometimes a total mm -hmm. right for them because mm -hmm. they inherited nothing else than bunches of pictures. Mm -hmm. And they maybe want to have a financial benefit of that inheritance. Mm -hmm. And I know it's always very easy to say it's art. It's art history. And there's a, there's a um, responsibility towards art history also with such an estate. But on the other hand, it's also about balancing the private interests of the children and the financial interest of the children mm -hmm. with the art historical approaches. And so it's about balancing that, and the foundation can be the right form absolutely for it. It's, it's the most well-known form for a reason. But on the other hand, a private form can also be a very good form. Yes, of course. We have Vereine yeah. in Germany, or a GmbH, non-profit. Einfach ist ab, a profit. It, I think yeah. even an estate can be a for-profit structure mm -hmm. in certain cases. Es kann es auch wandeln. <laughs> well, I think that um, it, that that goes back to the importance of the artist being involved, not only in their lifetime, but when they are, shall we say, sentient, and when they can make very, very sensible and very clear decisions about what they want. Because very few of them, presumably, want to, you know, disenfranchise their children by giving them nothing. So these are issues that should be. Um, um, uh, discussed. I mean, I know recently um, with um, Howard Hodgkin, there was a sort of slightly awkward moment when um, um, 
Howard's will revealed that he wanted to give a certain amount of money to his children. And then you know, it was revealed that, it, that there wasn't enough money in the bank to do this, you know. So then what, what happens? And so um, um, there is a foundation and they decided that they should just honor that one wish. And so they, they you know, ha had, had a big sale at Sotheby's. Mm -hmm. And so this is, um, but in a way they weren't, sufficiently organized to work out that this would not be possible and it would have been better if Howard had been involved and about those, those decisions and the children at an earlier age. So I think all of these things are, are, are very important. Um, I want to also ask you, how about a fallas? Because um, mm -hmm. it uh, was, uh, I was invited to Lint, um, Lentos Museum mm -hmm. because uh, there was a, a very export. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She um, made this uh, for us uh, and uh, um, to the um, opening of her exhibitions, she celebrated this mm -hmm. for us. And um, I thought this also interesting concept, for us instead of nachlas, for the artist. Mm -hmm. And maybe you know better about that. I, t I totally agree. It can be mm. a fantastic um, thing to do, especially because with a for us, mm -hmm you as the artist can still be kept engaged in the way that Forlas yeah. is then yeah. worked on. Mm -hmm. For example, if you combine it with a scholarship for young art historians working on that body of mm -hmm. work, you can be still the interview partner. Mm -hmm. They can talk to you. They can, um, y you can look what they're doing. You might even be inspired through that. And so that can be a wonderful mutual relationship. I thought so because of if the artist has not that lucky uh, family or, you know, mm -hmm. children like she has, no, I don't have any further generation mm -hmm. from my family. So it is so important to think about you create your own family like. Absolutely. No, yeah. so that yeah. they really emotionally you are committed. And uh, this uh, mutual interest mm -hmm. that you create during your, your live and uh, you create a so solid relationship, if it's not possible with the family, but then you can start like that. In this sense, I, uh, I thought it's a nice way to... And she also offered uh, her archive. And uh, yeah, and also one important thing, so you mentioned also a little bit, we should think about the next generation. It's so important for an artist to think about his or her own work, surviving immortally for, you know, forever. But <laughs> we also need to think about the, the, the generation after, you know, and, and even after, after, because it was a reason why I did, I, well, sacrifice sometimes my time, more than 20 years at the Udeka, you know, University of um, uh, Fine Art. It was a long time and it was my time, but I was always conscious about this. What is my work? What can I do through my work? What is my message? But also, what can you do through that to the next generation, you know? Mm -hmm. And this legacy is not only the work or the money, but also this legacy of love to the next yes. generation and, is so and, important. And teaching the next yeah, generation, exactly. guiding and talking. Yes. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they also, it's your legacy as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you live on through your pupils. <laughs> and artists always have, after all, in, in another sense. Um, mm -hmm. um, perhaps this is a good time to open up qu questions to the floor. Um, um, has, would anybody like to ask a question here? Um, about this very complicated... Um... Oh, good. Yeah, I just want to add something. My name is Goldman. Um, I work for an auction house. In... My name is Renate Goldman. I work for an auction house in Germany, and we are the only German auction house who deal with artists' estates. We manage eight artists' estates. And I just want to add some informations, um, or Frederike Hoffe can also do it, because we have actually in Germany a place for artists' estates of the German government. It's in Brauweiler, it's in North Rhine-Westphalia, and it's just what you all said. It's the same story. It's 35 estates there. They, build, they will build a new 
house for more states, probably five to ten, but then it's already full. This is for the like artworks, and we have a very important place for the archives of artists' estates, and this is in Nuremberg, in the Germanische Nationalmuseum. It's called Deutsches Kunstarchiv. Um, Frau Brogi is the new head uh, of this, and so I think this is even more important to have. Yeah. these state places, and they have to run also these state places. Mm -hmm. Plus, we have now new models, and then one of the biggest mm -hmm. new models is that big galleries, like Hauser and Wirth, Gagosian, Zwirner, they all now deal with, like, they have 20 estates, they have 30 estates, they, they collect more and more of these estates, and they replace the, the former museum's task, so to speak, mm -hmm. Um, so now we have a whole shift uh, concerning the art market, concerning art history, concerning the universities, concerning the museums, and I think one has to observe this. And at the end, and this is what I just wanted to add as a comment, we talk about cultural uh, heritage. We talk about cultural heritage, and we can talk it in a sense that we say we have like an international cultural heritage. What do we deliver from Europe? to the Arab world, or what do we deliver from Australia to South America, or from, I don't know, to the moon next time, yeah? So we have this shift of cultural heritage, and this is why there's a combination between this panel discussion and the panel discussion in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, what do we want to offer for the 21st, 22nd century as cultural heritage from individual artists and from art history or archaeology? Uh, to the next te next generations, and I think it's very important that we find a new answer all together. The private art market, mm -hmm. artists themselves, foundations, the states, government. So I think there are now the question is where is, what is the new form of the museum in the 21st century, and how do we fill these museums, and what form sh should have an artist's estate. So it all comes together, and I think there's a new task for everybody to, like these panels are making it clear, or Los Angeles, or wherever it takes place, um, that we have very new conditions, and um, that we have to find very new answers. Well, I would imagine that m the museums are increasingly a less good place um, as depositories of artists' estates because, you know, nobody has the money or the resources to really deal with them in a, in a very proactive way, which is um, obviously the, um, um, the commercial galleries um, are much richer. Yeah, well And I think there's a very fine line with the big galleries at the moment. Um, yes, every artist estate, successful artist estate, needs a strong gallery. But the, it's a totally quest different question for me than giving the whole estate to the gallery. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that that's the tendency at the moment, and you have the big five positioning themselves exactly in that area. But on the other hand, there are imminent contradictions in the goals, in the mid-time and long-term goals of an artist estate and the short and mid-term goals of a gallery. And you come into conflict of interests mm. automatically, mm. especially if there's not a strong management on the artist estate side, which is strong enough to discuss this fine line with the gallery again and again and again. And I think it's very important for the artist estates to know the art market themselves very well and to be a sparings partner with the gallery and to challenge the gallery always, again and again also, and not put themselves totally into the hands of the gallery. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, they need the gallery. So it, it's, it's a fine line there, and it can only be walked by having the know-how on the uh, artist estate side itself. And, and what and you said uh, um, from Brauweiler, uh, Brauweiler <laughs> is not very active. They are, um, they have um, not an. I, th I think it's uh, half of a Stelle. 
Es ähm, ist nur, nur eine halbe Stelle dort und äh, eine Stelle also noch, und noch eine halbe. Und ähm, die sind einfach personell völlig unterrepräsentiert. So, yeah, they um, don't count with the necessary staff. Um. It's uh, easier now. Um, um, Brauweiler hat eine zehnjährige Geschichte. Sie haben And ten years of history in Brauweiler. These estates have been collected, so we're talking about convolutes and not about estates. So they have changed, uh, understanding has changed. So estates that are relevant on the national level, but um, that has evolved over time. So the first estates that appeared, they were not really representative artists for the Federal Republic of Germany, so it's contradicting basically the argument that representative artists need um, a gallery that represents them. So Bau Brauweiler is basically an excuse for the Federal Republic to say, hey, come on, we've done something to cover that need. And uh, Madame Grütters um, has a channel for funding. But on the other hand, we would need a mixed financial financing model because there are so many relevant artists' estates in the regions being housed in the regions and we need for the artists and also for the owners of the estate, we need consultation and advice, we need an agency or an office to provide us advice. People are usually mourning after um, an artist passes away, so we need a structure and need um, a helping hand for these people, for the family. Families um, and like um, a manual and following it through step by step. And um, Madame Grutters has um, just sent out an invitation for photo archives. She's um, willing to found um, an archive for photos. And um, then there were critical voices saying that we basically don't need a collection, a national collection of photo archives in these places, but we need competence, we need consultation and advice. And I think that's one of the crucial points help them help themselves and um, keeping the threshold low and lending a helping hand to help the families structure themselves, build this infrastructure because many of the families cannot afford um, these consultants and I think that should be a priority. And Nuremberg, um, the case you mentioned is ideal of course, there is also um, many estates um, put down and written, so if you think about our yeah, written on paper, that's the Kernbestand. I think it's all a question of time. I'm afraid I'm, uh, I, can't, I can't possibly do that. She was um, talking about the German institution in Brauweiler. And it's a very um, German problem that there, 10 years ago, the German government set up the institutions, financed it, but in a very limited financial frame with only one, one and a half people sitting there. And um, that the strategy of Brauweiler changed over the last 10 years. They started taking in more randomly estates, and at a certain stage, they decide to take in only relevant estates, whatever that means in a German context. So, um, Frau Haufe, was stating that Brauweiler is kind of um, a not so successful project, if I may say that, but which still is important for the politics because the politics say, well, look, we're doing Brauweiler, but they're not doing Brauweiler in a very professional way. And then she was mm -hmm. commenting, uh, commenting in the second part on Nuremberg, where we have the National Archive, and um, that there is a lot, but she was pointing out that there's a differentiation between the um, archive archive which is my mostly much smaller in volume because it's paper or cds or U U usb sticks and not the whole artistic archive and that the whole problem of 
um, public institution and artist estates is often a question of room. Is there enough space to, um, to put all that into mm -hmm. storage? And we need, uh, thank you very much, and we need centers of advice in the regions so that, the, um, so that most of the people um, um, can be given a structure for, um, for, the f for their first questions. And it's, this can be realized with very low money. Yes, another question, please. Thank you for your opinions and information. Uh, I have a question, I don't know if uh, everybody else is interested. Is there any institution uh, at a European level uh, for pub public or private for artist estates? Do you have this information? Because you are talking a lot about um, Germany, yeah. which is great to know for me, but for example, <laughs> Anna Harris of a Spanish painter my husband is a monumental Austrian artist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sometimes it's getting more and more mixed in a, mm -hmm. and it would be great also to collaborate with the United States, but maybe eventually for me, but unless at the European level, maybe it would be time to try to put efforts together and coordinate. Some countries will be much more developed, mm -hmm. obviously, but I would like to know if you have any, any well, information. Um, publicly that. not. As to my knowledge, yeah. no. Yeah. Um, I mean, that was one of the motives why we found the Institute for Artist Estates. Um, we work internationally. We did the last workshop in, in Berlin, the one before that in London. Now we're going to LA. And you're totally rightly pointing out that it's an, the art market is a globalized one. Mm -hmm. And so when you work with an artist estates, you do have l local legal questions, but you have that the legal questions are only that much mm -hmm. of such a huge issue, mm -hmm. and the rest is a globalized issue. So um, we at the Institute try to have an overview of the legal situations in all relevant markets, but at the same time have the networks into the galleries in New York, in London, mm -hmm. in LA, in Spain, in France. We have clients from Spain we've worked with before, and it's totally important to have the international view on all this. Um, I think we've got time for another question. Well. Um, you talked about this fine line between the museum and also the galleries. Mm -hmm. And is, it is like that, that the big galleries also uh, finance a lot of um, research, publications. They sometimes have more art historians who write about an artist estate than, uh, than a muse museum would have the capacity. And what I was interested in is uh, this model of the galleries really changing at the moment as well. And how, what do you think like mid-range mid, mid galleries mm. could do to participate in this new model? Because they don't have the money to do this. To, to do the work of a, of a bigger gallery, to uh, elaborate an estate and to make it m valuable. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think if you look at the grandfather of all these models, like the Haus an Wirt Institute, it was the Wildenstein Institute. Mm -hmm. It was founded by the Wildenstein Gallery family two, three generations ago, mm -hmm. I think like 1940 something. And they compiled the catalogue raisonnés of all the grand masters of um, impressionist art but they did not do that only for the greater benefit. They were, through this research, they were the monopoly of the know-how of what works were in what private collections to later deal with that. That's the same model Gagosian does when he publishes on Picasso. That's the same model the big galleries do when they now all say, we'll invest mm -hmm. money into catalogue raisonnés, we'll invest money into mm -hmm. um, research. They can also by investing money into publications, mm -hmm. to get the direction of the interpretation. They have the monopoly on the interpretation if they pay for the interpretation all the time. So I think mm -hmm. it's really important to, to be aware of it. It doesn't mean that an estate shouldn't be using that, but it's important to be clear where are the motives. Mm -hmm. And you're totally right, for mid-sized galleries, it's extremely important to find their niche and it's difficult because a lot of money is involved in this field at the moment. But on the other hand, I think the mid-sized galleries can answer with trust. 
if they are able to build up mm -hmm. trust with the artist they've been working with and transform this trust when the moment an, an artist dies, it becomes an estate. And an estate is a different entity than an artist. And it has mm -hmm. An estate has different needs and it functions differently than the management of a living artist. Mm -hmm. And I think if a mid-sized gallery becomes aware of that different and builds know-how up in-house, mm -hmm. that it's a different approach dealing with the estate than dealing with an artist, then th and, they, and the second aspect is that they are very trustworthy in that transition and they are sensitive about this transition period. Then they have the chance to compete against the money of the big galleries because it's unpayable if you're in a trusted mm -hmm. long-term relationship. And I think uh, also that a lot of gal mid um, galleries practice it already. I've, uh, in our further educations in Switzerland and Germany, we are a lot of galleries who are interested in that uh, estate question. And if you have a look around, you, you see that Hauser and Wirt, Wirt is uh, kind of uh, going uh, forward, but uh, a lot of galleries um, also exhibit uh, estates. Yeah, I think it's and maybe the mid size the gallery, they support it, they start it, not mm -hmm. the big ones. Mm -hmm. I get sometimes mm -hmm. news by, um, mm -hmm. you know, Frau Bild and Frau Zeber mm -hmm. and suddenly they get that, and that's artist, I think. Wow, how, how <laughs> comes? They never mm -hmm. did take care of them. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the chance of the smaller mm -hmm. um, galleries or the mid uh, size mm -hmm. gallery, mm -hmm. it's personal relationship, yeah. uh, you know, and this is beyond the money. Yeah. And uh, of course, they need a certain, certain part, um, very financial um, mm -hmm. support, strong mm -hmm. financials, but not only to start with it. It's uh, this um, commitment, and this is the most important. They do first. And then comes the big fish. And so I think there are a lot of mm -hmm. ways, I'm sure. And I don't think the dialogue being held, uh, the discourse about um, current art should be held in the hands of five people and I mean, who have their own agendas. I mean, this is a really very dangerous position and we're all already having this in terms of what, which artists are being represented in museum exhibitions. So I think the plurality is a really important issue here and we do not want just one model and mm -hmm. the richest people winning through because um, it's not in their interests to support um, the legacy of an, mm -hmm. of an estate that isn't going to be particularly fruitful for them. And that is not, it you know, runs contrary to the ideas of, of the artists and the people who um, entrusted their um, works of art to them. So I think we should all be aware of this. Um, well, I think we should wrap it up now, and I would like very much to thank um, my three panellists here for a very interesting and um, rewarding morning. Thank you. Thank you. And also, when we have, um, you know, now um, people can ask questions too privately when we are um, over, over lunch. So it is not all over yet. Thank you. Thank you.